Yeah, good evening, everyone. It's my honor to introduce uh, senior diplomat, Mr. Sudhir Vyas this evening. Mr. Vyas retired as a secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs after over almost 36 years with the Indian Foreign Service. In the course of his career, and some of you might have already read the notice on Delhi Bird website is that he served as an ambassador of India uh, to primarily three countries, Germany, Bhutan, and UAE. He also held very senior diplomatic positions at the Indian missions in Islamabad, uh, the permanent mission of India to the UN at New York, as well as uh, in Kathmandu, Dar es Salaam, Cairo, and few other countries. Uh, during his tenure as a diplomat, he has also been doing birding, at times termed as a silent birder by uh, fellow birdman Vikram Grewal. Uh, and in fact, Vikram this morning was saying that uh, uh, Sudhirji, uh, watches a lots of birds and probably writes more than anyone else, uh, but he speaks the least. Uh, but if you really go to him and then seek a particular information, then he is ready with uh, all the details. Uh, Bikram also fondly remembered how he and Ambassador Vyas, along with um, another famous birder, Otto Feister, rediscovered or rather uh, noticed the bristled grass bird near Okla during, uh, I think, September 1996, after a gap of uh, more than three decades. Ambassador Vass has also been keeping uh, meticulous records of not just birds, but also uh, nature and nature conservation related stuff. When he was the ambassador in Bhutan, I think that was the golden time when uh, India and Bhutan also signed some contracts and uh, more or less uh, it, was, it was about final to do transboundary collaboration for Indo-Bhutan partnership for uh, nature conservation and which is already going on. Uh, Mr. Vass is also part of the Indo-Bhutan dialogue and as part of uh, an advisor to WWF India, he has been uh, guiding our work, uh, especially in the transboundary space a lot. So today we will hear more about uh, his experience and not from India, uh, from across the border. So over to you, Ambassador Vass. Thank you. Thank you very much, Devanka. Can you hear me? Is my voice going through? Absolutely. All good. Sir. Okay. Fair, lovely. Wonderful. Uh, you know, we've had so many discussions on this forum uh, on birds of India. So when I was asked to, to, to try and to find a topic to speak or to talk about, um, I looked at our neighborhood because uh, Birds do not respect national boundaries, and um, there is always a, a coming and going, a to and fro between uh, across national boundaries with our neighborhood. One had a choice either to look to the to the west and north, which is Pakistan, Afghanistan, Central Asia, Iran, and the Persian Gulf, or east and northeast, which is uh, Shezwan, Yunnan in China and Myanmar in Southeast Asia. But I've actually chosen to, to talk about the South. Now, if you look South, it is what you see is an oceanic domain, the Indian Ocean, with its myriad islands. And uh, here, it is, I think it is, it is important first to understand the, what we are talking about, the, the, the area that we are talking about, which will be the focus of my next slide. The Indian Ocean is not uh, like a smooth bowl of water. The floor of the ocean has got its own features. The ocean character changes as you move from near the coast to deeper water, from the tropics to the north. There are ridges, there are plateaus, there are submarine volcanoes, and the sea level fluctuates. During uh, glacial times, during cold weather, very cold uh, periods, you can have low stands in the Indian Ocean as far as 139 meters below the present sea level. And here, these plateaus and the, some, the submarine volcanoes now come above the water level 
and the topography of the Indian Ocean changes completely. Another very interesting character of the Indian Ocean is that it is, it's the only one with a half yearly reversing monsoon climate. The, monsoon, the, the southwest monsoon, the northwest monsoon switches and the character of the ocean currents of the, 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 the wind uh, directions change completely. For uh, the presentation today, uh, the Indian Ocean, of course, goes down right up to the Antarctic. But I have taken the Tropic of Capricorn at 23 uh, and a half degrees south as the southern limit. And I'll be talking about this area um, and the birds that inhabit it. The next slide uh, looks a little intimidating, but let me uh, show you is fairly straightforward. What we are talking about is the present geological era, the Cenozoic. In 66 million years ago, the MYA that you see on your screen is million years ago to the, to the present time. And this is the age of mammals because it begins with a massive event, the impact of an asteroid uh, that hit the earth 66 million years ago. It landed, I'm told, uh, somewhere near Mexico and really shook up the earth. This, it spewed some 4,000 gigatons of carbon into the air, causing a spike in global temperatures. It wiped out the dinosaurs and perhaps 75% of all living creatures on earth. It took a long time for the Earth to cool. And the, the period immediately after this impact, what, which is called the Cretaceous Paleogene Extension Event, uh, was the warmest in Earth's history. Anyway, it gradually cooled till around 20 million years ago, it, there was a transition to a point where modern, so-called modern ecosystems could uh, uh, take shape. Forests spread, and the forests at that time, we must understand, extended, let us say, all around the Indian Ocean. The, the areas that are desert today in Saudi Arabia and um, in West Asia and in Northwest, Northeastern Africa, these were forested. And it moved, it alternated between a warm periods and ice ages. This was also the, also the time when the early human ancestors appeared. And the fact that the shores of the Indian Ocean were inhabitable allowed them to spread and move into India and across the world. Then came the Pleistocene. 2.6 million years ago till the present. And this is the, a, the period which we are, which is going to recur over and over again in my presentation. This was a glacial period. The large mammals, the saber-toothed tigers, the mammoths, they all died out. The human beings evolved to a point where civilization began somewhere around 12,000 years. Let me move on to the next slide, which is how did the Indian Ocean appear? The supercontinent of Gondwana land, the southern half of the earth, began to split apart, began to rift something like 200 million years ago. And India drifted away from Africa and then split, leaving Madagascar behind and collided with the Eurasian plate somewhere around 36 million years ago. By geological standards, this was a supersonic speed. I mean, it was almost Razani speed, which the, uh, something like 15 to 20 centimeters a year, the Indian subcontinent moved. And by 36 million years ago, the Indian Ocean took, out, took, uh, took its roughly its present configuration. Around the same time, 
as uh, the the um, or soon after the impact of the asteroid there was the indian ocean was turbulent in a very turbulent state and something called the reunion hotspot which is a area where lava magma from deep inside the earth's core comes to the surface and a massive eruption eruption took place at this time around between 64 and 45 million years ago this split the seychelles from india and spewed layer upon layer of gas of lava onto land and onto the seabed and these are what constitute peninsular india today the deccan traps the mascarene plateau and various volcanic islands in the indian ocean many of which are now submerged appear the hot spot was then relatively quiet for almost 30 million years then reactivated the old hot spot islands had eroded and we are not talking in millions of years mind you we are not talking of a year or tens of years or decades they eroded many of them went below the surface of the water but new islands appeared as volcanoes brought fresh material from the from deep inside the earth to the surface and these were the mascarene islands east of Mad of uh, madagascar at the same time australia broke from antarctica which was the southern part of the of the uh, of gondwana land and moved east around 65 million years ago and it is still in the process of moving further north and the movement of of the indian subcontinent of the indian plate has been blocked by the himalayas when it, as it hit the eurasian plate it pushed up the himalayas as a plow would push up the earth a new when it cuts through the uh, through the soil and something similar is will perhaps happen many many million years millions of years hence as australia will swing across around that borneo and hit the eurasian plate again perhaps somewhere near vietnam or china and you will have another himalayan range many 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 millions of years hence and this this is the sea but there are islands and this is also going to be a focus of my presentation today long back john dunn in 1624 wrote a little poem and it started saying no man is an island entire of itself every man is a piece of the continent a part of the main but this applies just as as um, uh, cogently to the islands themselves because there is always an interaction between islands and the mainlands and between the islands themselves so no island is ever actually isolated and islands of course are of various kinds there are continent fragments fragment which um when gondwana land split it left behind fragments and one of the largest is madagascar it is the fourth largest island in the world after um uh, greenland and borneo and um, new guinea and um, the seychelles is another very small continental fragment a subset of continental fragments is something called continental islands the best example in front of me is sri lanka the only difference is that they are still on the continental shelf and therefore subject to fluctuations in sea level then you have oceanic islands on from the ocean floor under submarine volcanoes can rise above the water so water surface and create an island christmas island near australia is one of these and so are so are mauritius reunion rodrigues and a whole host of other um, uh, islands in the indian ocean southern indian ocean 
and when these oceanic islands erode and go below the surface of the water corals and other uh, marine flora and fauna grow on them to create coral reefs and atolls which then show above the surface of the sea and again offer habitat for land creatures now you will ask me why what is all this to do with birds so let me move straight straight uh, move straight ahead and start talking about birds first because we are in oceanic domain let me talk about the pelagics the sea birds some 50 species or so um of pelagic species both sea birds inhabit the indian ocean and the list is there before you on the screen i'll not read through it but there are a whole variety of them from several families of of birds this is the fu full list of birds that are regularly occurring in the indian ocean the ones that you see with a star don't cross the equator they but they do cross the tropic of capricorn and uh, will appear and can be seen around uh, mauritius or reunion or the southern parts of madagascar the ones that are in bold breed in the indian ocean they nest on the and the others which are not neither starred nor in bold are visitors and we will talk about them in a second some 29 species of sea birds breed in the indian ocean this includes three shear three species of shearwaters four petrels three frigate birds four bobies three tropic birds then there is a group of birds which breed in the subantarctic subantarctic islands and move north in the austral winter which is the northern summer and this will include several petrels small storm petrels small birds wilsons white faced blackberry and larger shearwaters like the flesh footed shearwater is a typical constituent of this group um, uh, which come across and come in fact into the arabian sea and the bay of bengal uh, and can be seen around indian shores yet another group is comprises east west migrants swinholes and masgaira storm petrels bulwers petrels peak shearwaters these breed in the northern and central pacific come south into the into the pacific and cross the lombok straits and the uh, the islands the, the islands and of the of southeast asia and the sundas to enter the indian ocean and these come in in the northern winter and then there are five species of skuas which are non breeding visitors three that come in from the arctic two that come in from the antarctic and we've had a wonderful presentation some time ago by deepu or it's focused specifically on skuas and their movements in the indian ocean so i will stay away from that now as i said the 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 oceans are not uniform in character this area from northeastern africa across the coasts of saudi arabia southeastern coasts of saudi arabia between the months of may to september face the onslaught of the southwest monsoon which moves from here across the southwest and into the indian subcontinent and low level strong air streams which is called the 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 somali current the the, the somali um uh, current which blows the warm waters of the ocean away from the coast from these coasts colder waters from below come to the surface and these are very nutrient rich very very biologically productive and they are a rich source of protein food and protein for sea birds now look at wilson storm petrel as you we heard about a minute ago 
this breeds in the subantarctic and comes north across the indian ocean and to reach here somewhere around may when this nutrient rich waters bring food to the surface and they come in their thousands and millions and join the seabirds which uh, breed in that area joanian spectral for example and persian shear waters and live off this rich picking uh, the fresh uh, fresh uh, um, pink bills uh, fresh build fresh footed shear waters also follow a similar pattern then they move clockwise across the arabian sea to move down the coast the western coast of india in july and august by in september in july sept august and september a massive movement of these sea birds and turns and so on takes place along the west south, southwards along the west coast of india which is a spectacle for anyone venturing out into the pelagic at that time then there is a whole host of other movements which i'll not go into because i think this probably getting into too much detail uh, in in the bay of bengal for example and the sea birds can be can can be pushed by unseasonal uh, uh, weather patterns the the recent um, uh, cyclonic storm uh, in the bay of bengal brought shear waters and petrels right into the hooghly hooghly river and pushed them push these birds south from from the southern portions of of india right up to the sundarbans and into the sundarbans those that breed in the indian ocean need reefs sandbanks or predator free oceanic islands and um countries like the seychelles um uh, australia and a whole host of others um mauritius and and um, rodrigues they go to tremendous lengths to ensure that these sea breeding islands are predator free and i'll talk a little bit more about them as we go along but i just want to mention two or three very very special islands christmas islands which is the forested top of a volcano of australia has three species of birds that breed only here and nowhere else in the world one is abbot's booby you see a picture here the other is the christmas island frigate bird which also comes to indian shores and sometimes wanders uh into sri lankan and southeast indian waters and uh, the a golden race fulvus of the white tailed tropic bird this is a stamp a christmas island stamp it has traits a extremely beautiful uh, as it is tropic birds are remarkable remarkably beautiful and with this golden sheen on its plumage this is really extraordinary coming to the mascarenes if you um just off mauritius is an island called round island and i always want to speak a little bit about the breeding sea birds of this because this is very unusual it seems to have been colonized around 1940 in the 1940s by petrels and these are wide ranging sea birds the petrels that breed in an island of brazil called trinidad islands and that species is called the trinidad petrel and it seems to have found its way to um uh, mauritius then it was joined by two other petrels from the pacific the herald and the kerma deck petrels and they are all now settled on round island of mauritius and are interbreeding and will probably produce a new species sometime in the future we presume it will be called the round island bird another example of how the seas can be a barrier to movement but can also facilitate movement 
is Barao spectral, which breeds on reunion in the Indian Ocean. There's a tree in Hawaii, which grows in the mountains, the high mountains. It's an acacia with white flowers, which is called the koa tree. And there is something called a highland tamarind, again, with, which lives in the high mountains of Reunion. And these two islands are 18,000 kilometers apart. And yet, it has been found by genetic analysis that they are practically the same species. Now, how did this happen? Is this convergent evolution? It is thought more likely that a seabird moved or was blown or was vagrant from perhaps Hawaii to the Indian Ocean and some of the seeds of this tree stuck to its feet because it also breeds in the areas where the poor tree grows and transplanted those trees in the Union. And interestingly, this spectral, this is the one we are talking about, Barao spectral. It has a very similar species that lives in Hawaii, which is called the Hawaiian spectral. Is there a link? Could it be the same bird that has evolved here? And finally, I just uh, also briefly mentioned the mascarine spectral, a rare bird with a population of just about 100 to 200 individuals that lives again on Reunion Island, threatened by, uh, by introduced predators, particularly rats and cats, and light pollution, which causes it to be attracted to lights and collide against glass panes. It was recorded off and on in the 19th century, then lost for 80 years, it was not seen again, until refound in the 1970s. This is what it looks like. Again, this is just, just an illustration. Uh, seabirds breeding in the, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, these are lesser noddies, which breed on Cassurina trees uh, all over the Indian Ocean, including in the Maldives and, and um, in, in many of the islands. This is again a tropic bird. This is the white-tailed tropic bird, which nests in either tree hollows or in, in little caves. And you see it uh, in an adult with a chick. And here down is uh, one of the frigate birds. Uh, this is a male in display when it inflates a gular, bright crimson gular sac under its bill. And um, these, these are spectacular parasitical birds. In fact, uh, they um, uh, chase terns, gulls, and other seabirds, petrels, and so on, which have caught some prey and make it drop it and live off the tropics. Now, islands, we go to the islands, which is perhaps the most interesting part of, of, of um, this presentation. Now, these are remarkable concentrations of biodiversity, and there's a whole theory of, of uh, island by geography. Uh, which looks at this. And I quickly run through some of the main points of these. Firstly, islands have very limited ecological niches. There's not, they don't have that variety of habitats that are available on the mainland. Then, how do they get populated by birds? They either get blown there because of currents and wind currents and winds or uh, are, are brought there uh, sort of on, on uh, floating flotsam and so on, or fly there. But at the, so they, there's a rate at which an island, a newly formed island, for example, gets populated and fills up the niches that are available there, the ecological niches. But as the niches begin to fill and the numbers of immigrant species increases, the less easy it is for them to survive, and the smaller and more prone to extinction, their individual population, populations of each species become. And therefore, some become extinct. And as input from immigration balances output from extinction, because they failed, they were failures in terms of ecological adaptation and could not compete with more um, competitive species, the number of species stabilizes. 
but of course there's a steady turnover uh, in the in the assemblage in the faunal composition so you get new species coming in and old species going out distant islands the lower they have a lower immigration rate that is understandable hence fewer species and vice versa large islands have no more species with a greater variety of habitats that's a no brainer islands have insular conditions faced with less competition and greater availability of dishes and therefore birds adapt to these various to exploit these various food sources and this is called adaptive radiation like the darwin's finches from where darwin derived his 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 theory his um, theory of evolution um and we will see it also in madagascar and it's very very evident in hawaii then there's also a greater level of endemicity birds that are found there that have evolved to a certain level in that island which makes them completely different from the from the species from which they evolved and these then become endemic to the island itself continental islands may preserve species that die out on the mainland remember the continental islands are close to the mainland part of the same continental shelf but they are shielded from competition so these species they may continue to survive there while they die out on the mainland itself and we will see some examples of this introduced species tend to become invasive due to lack of competition there is no control and they can com completely destroy uh, an ecosystem if introduced without prior consideration and because of the absence of predators birds tend to lose the power of flight it cause it, it flight requires energy and tremendous amounts of energy and if they can do without it they would rather do without it and unless or until they a new arrival on the island over competes them and they lose out andaman and nicobar are not strictly within our as are within our borders and not strictly without outside them but i just want to mention a few points this is uh, these are sorry uh, these are this is a submerged range along a tectonic tectonic contact zone where the indian plate meets the uh, the, the eurasian plate and pushes uh, these um, uh, these um, uh, this range up above the surface of the water 65 million years old 550 andaman islands 22 nicobar islands separated by a channel called the 10 degree channel 150 meters wide it's close enough to the mainland particularly to southwest myanmar and yet it has a high rate of endemism in birds alone 30 endemic bird species and 75 subspecies the islands were colonized by in island hopping mainly from southwest myanmar and their faunal composition is largely therefore indo-malayan as well as indian affinities are both to malaya as well as to india and the fauna taken as a whole would probably be part of the indo-malayan subregion the differences from the mainland are immediately apparent to anyone who goes there they are very poor in game birds in galliforms with only one species the blue-breasted quail uh, in the in the nicobars just two warblers no babblers which probably find it difficult for these water crossings but disproportionately rich in hawks nine raptors eight pigeons eight kingfishers probably richer than an equivalently sized region on the mainland but most interesting is not a bird it is that little green lizard that you see below this is called the andaman gay gecko day gecko and the center of uh, of the uh, of radiation of these day geckos is madagascar 5000 kilometers away how did it reach the andamans this is one of the oldest members of the genus one of the basal 
in the in the genetic field and can only have been carried at that time there were no people shuttling between the islands who would perhaps carry these these geckos in in uh, in a in a load of bananas or or wood or wood piles or whatever they must have traveled floating on logs which were blown across the indian ocean 5000 kilometers to reach um the andamans i saw a, a picture once of uh, a lizard a photograph of a lizard on a uh, on a a log sort of being uh, uh, floating along the sea and being pushed along by the waves looking uh, well <laughs> for all uh, for all it looking like some little green captain i have in search of a moby dick somewhere across the waves but it is really uh, to to use uh, to borrow a phrase from bertie wooster it boggles the mind to think that little that little green lizard could travel 5000 kilometers in a log from madagascar to the andamans it's quite common in the andamans actually and it's been spread by hiding in banana banana uh, trees or, or uh, uh, banana fruit which was which is carried by canoe from island to island i move to sri lanka now this is a continental island periodically connected with india if you see this uh, this chart below you will find that over the last uh, 500 years at least five times uh, the, the sea level fell below the present sea level which is marked by this line 1 2 3 4 and 5 so at that time sri lanka connects with india and animal movement founder movement can take place in both directions the last time this was connection to this connection took place was 8000 years ago now sri lanka has a dry zone and a wet zone uh, fauna and the wet zone fauna is a very characteristic one with a very high level of endemicity 86% of its amphibians and reptiles are found only there only there in the world of 460 bird species in sri lanka 200 242 are residents of which 34 are own, are only in sri lanka are endemic as a 7.4% this is the highest level of endemicity in the region the faunal affinities are clearly indian because of the connection and yet over 80 species of birds have developed distinct sri lankan subspecies and But what I find interesting is that very often the Western Ghats in the Sri Lankan wet zone are considered as one biodiversity hotspot. But that's not really strictly true. The Sri Lankan wet zone acts as an isolated island. It is not just an extension of the Western Ghats. It has endemic clades. It has endemic. It has a limited bio biotic interchange with the Western Ghats. And as an example. There are several bird species that are alien that exist in the wet zone of Sri Lanka, but are alien to the Western Ghats. And examples: the red-faced mal malcoha, a very striking species here. A serendib scopsau, which has no relation uh, in the Western Ghats. The Sri Lankan blue magpie, its closest relatives are in the Himalayas. But what happened in the Western Ghats? yellow-eared bulbul sri lankan white eyes and i'll speak about white eyes in a minute the sri lankan bush warbler has its closest relatives again in the himalayas but nothing in the peninsula of india the white-faced starling and the sri lankan whistling thrush and perhaps more and there are other oddities there are of course a large number of raptors in sri lanka but no vultures except odd vag vagrants why not it is so close it could why and vultures are they all are, were, at least were all over south india in large numbers but they did not seem don't, don't, don't seem to have crossed why tree pies there are no tree pies in sri lanka is that why the blue magpie survived and did not survive in the western ghats i don't know i mean is it because uh, the, the tree pie would have offered such competition to the to the blue magpie that blue magpie could not survive in the western ghats but it survived in sri lanka this was one of the uh, the principles of uh, island by geography that i mentioned earlier 
Now look at the white eyes of Sri Lanka. There are two species. There's a Sri Lanka and the in, uh, Sri Lanka white eye, the larger, um, uh, darker one, and the Indian white eye, which is extends over much of Sri Lanka. At one time, it was thought that these were basically in situ speciation, that within the island, is because of the ha different habitats, they split into two species. But genetic studies show that they are not, this is not in situ speciation. They are, this, they are very different lineages of white eyes. And in fact, this, the Sri Lankan white eye is a very old basal lineage, which, uh, how, did it, how did it reach Sri Lanka? We do not know. Also, they are not derived from the same continental population. So their ancestral populations were different. This one, of course, the Indian um, uh, white eye is the, Indian, the, the, ancestral, the ancestral lineage is the Indian white eye in India, all over India. But this one, we don't know. In situ speciation also takes place. Look at the flame backs. The black rumped flame, flame back and the Sri Lankan flame back, which have a scarlet back, a red back, were considered races at one time. But it, they, it's now found that through genetic studies that there are very limited exchange between the two, genetic exchange. So they are now considered different species and perhaps in the process of separating completely. Racket tail bronchus. The Sri Lankan race, Sinonicus, and the wet zone race, Dophorinus, are all look very different. They were formally reported to integrate, but the two ecological zones are now so completely separated that this is probably now going to stabilize as another species altogether. It is already considered another species distinct from the racket tail rumbo. Lakshadweep. The Lakshadweep Maldives Shagos Ridge emerged when the reunion hotspot threw up uh, lava through a crack in the Indian subcontinental uh, plate. And this long ridge, which you see from uh, just southwest of India, said it has never been connected with the mainland. It is a true oceanic island, but badly eroded. They are very old, 65 million years old, and eroded to just below the level of the sea. So it's only coral reefs and atolls that grow, coral atolls that grow on sea mounts, which are just a few meters below the sea surface. Uh, they, are, they have a very impoverished land fauna, land bird fauna, because they are they're not much land. But many seabirds breed. Lakshadweep has about 20 atolls with many species of seabirds breeding. Maldives has 26 atolls in an 870 kilometers long chain with some more than 10 species of seabirds breeding there. The Shagos has five atolls, 500 kilometers south of the Maldives. But these colonies of seabirds are the most diverse perhaps in the tropical Indian Ocean with 18 species present. But in spite of this extended separation, and perhaps because of their relative proximity to the, to the Indian coast, there are not many endemics. The only Maldives has four endemic subspecies, as um, endemic subspecies. And the most interesting one is this one, DDI, uh, a race of the striated heron. And if you look at this picture here, and if you know the striated heron on the Indian subcontinent, on the Indian mainland, they look so different. When I first saw this on, um, on, uh, in Mali, I was completely confused. I didn't know what it was. But it's the striated heron, and it has evolved into a very distinct race. The others, incidentally, are not very distinct. Only minor differences of um, size and, and the shade of color. I mentioned Sokotra, which is an island of Yemen. It's a largest island, 3,600 3, square kilometers, and it's a continental fragment, but isolated for, for a very, very long time. 
is biogeographically African and with a very high degree of endemicity. The flagship species is this remarkable tree. It's called the dragon's blood tea tree with crimson resin, which is in fact the state tree of uh, the Socotra. It has about 10 endemic bird species, but the only one I want to mention, and I'll talk about this a little further down, is the Socotra scops owl, whose closest relatives are not African. They are Indian. They are the oriental scops owl and the Seychelles scops owl and the Socotra scops owl. They form one group. How this happened? We do not know. And we will talk, I'll just talk about it a little further down. Now, the Malagasy fauna. Malagasy, by Malagasy, when I talk about Malagasy, I'm talking about Madagascar, the Seychelles, Mauritius, Reunion, Rodrigues, and the associated islands, Agalega, Farquhar, Cromlin, and so on and so forth. If you look at just the native land birds and not uh, the seabirds, 68% of are of African origin, but 27% are Asian and 6% are Australasian. It is very far from India. It's almost 4,000 kilometers. So how did this happen? If you look at all vertebrates taken together, the Asian component of the fauna exceeds the African. This is not what is called recariance. Recariance is if a continent splits and breaks up a population of species into two groups and both evolve independently, then that is called a recariant pair, or like a recariant species. This is not recariance emanating from Gondwana land. Madagascar separated, separated from Africa 165 million years ago and from India 88 million years ago. And all these species, but most modern genera, post-date the separation of India and Madagascar and India and Africa by up to 90 million years. So they must have come after the separation. They are not vicarian. There are vicarian species, of course, in Madagascar. The extinct elephant birds, which died out around 1600 AD, issued in the largest birds known, flightless, and related to the to the ostriches and so on. Uh, they were an example of Gondwana land vicarians. And in Seychelles, vicarians is perhaps the best explanation for links with India. For example, frogs, Seychelles frogs, and purple frogs of the Western Guards, which were in fact Bijou discovered perhaps only in 2003, if I'm not mistaken. They are very closely related. Uh, genetically, but they separated and took their own evolutionary paths when Seychelles split from India 75 million years ago, whereas the reunion hotspot broke up the, the, uh, the Indian fleet. We move on. Um, what I call a passage from India. How did how do you explain the Asian affinity to so many Madagascar taxa? Over the past um, uh, eras uh, over the Cenozoic era, the last 40 million years, sea levels have fallen and, and dropped. It has dropped up to a maximum of 139 meters below the present level. And even at 80 uh, meters below present sea level, major islands appeared. There's the, the uh, Maldives, Chagos Ridge, the Central Indian Ridge, which is called the Carlsberg Ridge, the Plat Seychelles Plateau and the Mascarene or the Mauritius Madagascar Plateau. Then these were large islands. They are islands that formed and remained for more than 50,000 years or more. Enough time for forests to grow on these islands, birds to colonize them, and birds to evolve there. 50,000 years is enough to, to, for this to happen. So these islands form the series of stepping stones between India and the Seychelles masculine plateau. And birds which moved, evolved along the way to reach these areas. And this is what explains the link. 
Then there is also the northeast monsoon and easterly winds and currents which blow from Indonesia towards Madagascar. In fact, Madagascar, the dominant tribe in Madagascar are the marina of the highlands of Madagascar and their origins are Indonesia. They traveled from Indonesia to Madagascar, a distance of more than 4,000, 3,000 kilometers on these ocean currents, on their catamarans and, um, and they were seafaring, seafaring people of course, they traveled and settled here. And in fact, uh, by from genetic analysis, it seems that the lineage of this largest tribal group of Madagascar traces its lineage to just 30 mothers from one locality in Indonesia. So this movement, east-west movement can also take place. And whether these two mechanisms worked supporting each other or independently, we don't know. But the fact that, as we will see, there's also been a colonization in the reverse direction. Mascarene species settling down in India would favor the stepping stone islands theory because the winds are unidirectional. I'll move on. So these are the Asian flavors and look at the, look at the range of species that, ex that, uh, that exist in the Malagasy region. Over the last 5,500,000 years, sea levels fell by over 60 meters in at least five occasions. Islands, as I mentioned, persisted for 50,000 years. Ducks closest to the Andaman Teal in Mauritius. The Dodo and the Solitaire, and I'll come to that, ancestry in South Asia, 26 million years ago. Blue pigeons, apparently from Australasia. But I doubt, one, one doubts whether 4.7 4 million years ago, coming, crossing 3,000 or 4,000 kilometers of ocean on ocean winds seems very unlikely. And more likely is they moved north into the Indian subcontinent and came down the stepping stones to colonize the Mascarines. Swift trips, these could possibly have been blown uh, from Southeast Asia, which is the center of evolution of swift lift. Although they appear to be closest to the Indian swift lift of the Western Gulfs. Mascarine pirate, parrots, and I will have more to talk about this. This is a, this is a remarkable group of species. I'm running out of time also. Uh, Vasa parrots come, came from Australia and so on. I'll just go down to some of these. In the reverse direction, scop sows, day geckos, chameleons moved from the mascarines into South Asia. Madagascar, a dazzling range of species that exist. Fourth largest island, it is 3,800 kilometers from India, but only 400 kilometers from, a from Africa. And yet you have these affinities with Asian lineages. 90% of its fauna is endemic, including more than half of its native breeding lanterns. It has two endemic orders all to itself and five families. And these two endemic, and two of these endemic families have a substantial oriental input. One are the acetes, which are related to the broadbills of, 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 um, of Asia, shared a common ancestor that evolved perhaps on the Indian landmass after it had separated from Africa and then moved back over the stepping stones to, uh, to isolate itself in Madagascar, where four species, this is Shegel's acety and a sunbird acety, evolved with these bright um, wattles of, of bare skin, um, uh, shining, shining wattles on their faces. Wangas are a most remarkable family. Some form of shrike, they're really, uh, and they arrived in Madagascar and radiated. The textbook example of adaptive radiation one species split into 21 species in 15 genera and look at the range of beaks exploiting every possible ecological niche. There's one that acts like a nuthatch, climbs up trees, one that has a long beak, pry open bark, a huge beak which feeds on nuts and hard nuts and, uh, and animal um, uh, food and so on. 
and their closest relatives as seen through genetic studies are both in asia and in africa and the asian hypo the asian relatives are wood shrikes which we are which we can see in delhi itself or in and all over india and fly catcher shrikes of southern india and the himalayas and southeast asia and a group called the philentomas which are used to be called the shrike fly catchers which are essentially southeast asia they are very close to the to the wangos and then in africa you also have relatives uh, the helmet shrikes and uh, the shrike fly catchers of africa so how did this link take place did they evolve in madagascar travel to both africa and asia did they evolve in asia and move to madagascar and then to africa the second option second option seemed a little more likely given the stepping stone theory because it's very very unusual for a bird of this kind to have moved eastwards without stepping stones anyway so the, uh, the you go on, this is more uh, madagascar endemics these are the two the mesites and this big headed fellow kakurola these are the two endemic orders of birds which are unique to madagascar no where else in the world these are round rolls uh, there are four species of these again endemic to uh, to madagascar This one has this lovely Latin name called Uratel ornis camera. It is really a camera, in uh, in terms of how rarely it is seen and how wonderful it is when it's actually actually seen. Uh, An ibis with white wings, which lives in the forests. This is a a subfamily, a cuckoo family called the cuckoo, called the blue coas, which are only in Africa, and blue pigeons. Which existed, which at least were there in all the Mascarene Islands, and their closest ancestor is this remarkable bird. It is a, a fruit pigeon, which is called the cloven feathered dove, and it is found in New Caledonia, between Australia and New Zealand. How on earth did it reach here? And the only answer can be that fruit doves were much more widespread when forests were more widespread. and extended into india and moved south from india and sri lanka down the stepping stones to reach madagascar seychelles again as you can see there both you have granit granitic seychelles which are a fragment of the indian plate isolated for 75 million years now they are separated by over almost 3000 kilometers um 42 islands are granitic as you can see stones the others are coral reefs and um, and um, atolls unique assemblage of species and as you can see here 12 endemic species seven are asian only we want um these are birds of the seychelles this one is extinct this is a parrot which looks very much like um, our large indian parakeet but it was much smaller and didn't have the pink on the back of the neck it is extinct since about 1906 this is is one is a, a, a seychelles black parrot ancestry australian this is a blue pigeon you saw the blue pigeon a few minutes back in madagascar this is the seychelles species of blue pigeon again ancestry australasian Sooty terns on Bird Island, which is a bird breeding colony. Magpie robins. Again, there are two species here. Look very much in shape and size like a magpie robin, but different patterns. This is all black with a white wing patches. And this is a paradise flycatcher, black paradise flycatcher. Two invasions seem to have taken place of this paradise flycatchers. One that frequented the Mauritius, that uh, that uh, uh, evolved and settled down in Mauritius and Reunion and this and the Madagascar paradise flycatcher which settled down in Seychelles and Madagascar this lowest slide is a very interesting one the mascarenes madagascar but even more so mauritius um reunion seychelles and rodrigues had are the last home of giant tortoises and they were hunted in enormous numbers to 
by the Europeans to stock up for food for their sailors as they traversed the globe. They died out because, because of excessive hunting in, uh, in, in Mauritius, in Rodrigues, where they were so abundant that you could walk practically across the island without stepping on the ground, just on the backs of these horses. Um, and in Reunion. But this, the, uh, the Seychelles one survives on Aldabra. And um, it, um, there are about 100,000 of them, one lakh of them. It's still okay. One interesting tale which links it with India. This is perhaps the oldest known, longest known lifespan of any vertebrate creature um, in the world. One, a four of these tortoises were presented to Robert Clive in Kolkata in seventh year after, after his victory at uh, Plassey. And these are estimated to have been born in 1750. Three died. One went through uh, various owners till um, a gentleman called Schwendler, who was with the Post and Telegraph Department of the, uh, of the British government and who maintained a menagerie, came into possession of this individual and presented it to the Alipur Zoo when it was created. It died in, after its shell cracked uh, in 2006, having lived for 255 years. I find this a fascinating link between Aldabra Island uh, tortoise and the Alipur Zoo in Kolkata. The other creature you see here is uh, Aldabra ray. It is the only flightless bird left now in the Indian Ocean. And in Madagascar lives a relation called the white-throated whale. And it's prone to sudden expansions and eruptions of population. Apparently, such an eruption took place some 136,000 years ago. And the birds reached Aldabra, where they evolved flightlessness. And then, the uh, sea levels rose and Aldabra came underwater. Many, many millen uh, millennia later, sea levels receded again and the islands emerged. White-throated whales again colonized Aldabra and again developed flightlessness. The same quality evolved twice from a same source population is called iterative evolution. And this is perhaps one of the very, very few examples of that. The Mascarene Islands, Mauritius, Rodrigues, Reunia, uh, again about 700 to 1,500 uh, 1, kilometers east of Madagascar. They are the youngest, much younger than the others. Mauritius and Rodrigues are probably around 8 to 10 million years old. The Reunion, he still is alive, has a live volcano. Two million years old. The, they are on a plateau, based on, they stand on a plateau. They are volcanic islands, they stand on a plateau, with a not very deep depths from about 8 to 150 meters. And again, many masculine birds have origins in South Asia, not Madagascar or Africa. And many flightless forms. It has a dubious distinction, this distinction, these unfortunate islands of losing 21 species in the last 400 years since human colonization. The dodo, the solitaire, many parrots, starlings, rails, pigeons, ducks, owls, victims of hunting, most insidiously introduced exotics like cats, rats, and monkeys, and habitat loss. Only 16 endemics survive. Here's a woodcut from the 16th century of what the, what the island was when it appeared. The animals were very tame. And as you can see, they were being hunted with sticks. These are parrots, dozens of them. And if, you, if, they, if they used to say that if you caught one of these 
masquerine gray parrots, it would start squealing and it would attract hundreds of gray parrots to try and help it. And they would just be knocked down with sticks. You see a man knocking down parrots with sticks and there. That is supposed to be a, uh, um, a, a dodo, I think, but it doesn't look like one. Uh, and this are one of these are the turtles, the giant turtles of Mauritius. You can seat a person and there are some sitting in a turtle shed. We move on, the dodo and the solitary. This is a dodo is a poster word for extinction. It was first found by the Dutch, first mentioned in, in, a, in a description in 1599. And the last reliable report of a dodo was a party of about 10 or 12 birds on a small offshore island in 1662. All of them were hunted to death. Certainly, it did not cross 16, this is year 1680. A, a, a bird that had evolved in 40 million years was wiped out within 100 years of discovery. The solitaire survived a little further till 1760. Now, uh, a DNA analysis conducted in 2002 um, uh, shows that uh, uh, compared the DNA, a dodo DNA from um, a specimen, parts of a specimen preserved in the Oxford uh, Natural History Museum, which still has some soft uh, material. So DNA was extracted from that and, and uh, they found that the dodo and solitaire are sister species with the closest relative being the Nicobar pigeon, which is of Southeast Asia, which extends up to the Nicobar. So this creature obviously came down the stepping stones. Re uh, just, just come to that in a minute. The next closest relatives are crowned pigeons of New Guinea. This is a crown pigeon. There are four species of these in New Guinea. And the tooth billed pigeon of Samoa. This is a tooth billed pigeon. You notice the similarity in the beak. But in many ways, this was a very likely predecessor of the dodo. Uh, I mean, it, it looks very different. Although, um, as a uh, uh, midwife is supposed to have said after seeing a child that she had delivered 54 years later, a comment was, Why well, you haven't changed a bit? <laughs> changed a bit. The, um, in many ways, it was similar. It's a nomadic uh, bird. It moves from island to island. It feeds on the ground. It, um, and most interestingly, both this species as well as the dodo and the solitaire have gizzard stones. One stone that they swallow, which helps them in digestion and in grinding hard seeds within the, uh, as part of their digestion. Many birds swallow grit, but they have just one stone in, the, in their gizzards. And this the pigeon does this, and so do the uh, dodo and solitaire. They seem to have diverged from an Asian ancestor some 40 million years ago and from each other 26 million years ago, that is before the, the Mauritius and the Greeks emerged. So they must have evolved on the now sunken hotspot islands, the reunion hotspots, perhaps as smallish flighted pigeons capable of inter-island flight. And then each isolated group evolved flightlessness, perhaps eight to five million years ago. Again, perhaps an example of convergent evolution. But what did these uh, the dodo actually look like? And this is going to be mostly it's, it's, it's portrayed in a cartoon form. These pictures on top, which you are on top of the slide, you see the head. That is a sketch of a freshly of the head of a freshly killed dodo by a man called Lel from the log of the Gelderland, a Dutch ship. In the log book of the Gelderland. These are his own sketches. But as curiosities, many were taken to Europe by wealthy collectors, a few to England, three to Europe, one at least to Batavia, one to Japan, and they were sketched. 
This is one of the oldest sketch, which is slightly, which is stylized and almost cartoon-like, painted but painted by life by someone called Roland Savory, an art, a Dutch artist. This one is a, a bird that was formed the menagerie of uh, one, the, the king of Bavaria, king of Bohemia, sorry. And this is probably a stuffed uh, dodo. Um, looks shrunken, looks disproportionate, but uh, still copied from life. This is perhaps the last portrait of a living dodo. 1638, dodo head by someone called Saftle. Again, Dutch, possibly the last illustration. But this is what I want to talk about. There's a miniature in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg in Russia. Presumably, and this is uh, an assumption by Ustad Mansur, which depicts the dodo. Now, Ustad Mansur was one of the court painters of Emperor Jahangir. Jahangir, uh, as Salim Ali says, uh, had he been the head of a natural history museum instead of the emperor of India, he would have been a better and a happier man. He loved natural history. And uh, the visitors to his court all realized that they brought exotic animals and birds from far and wide um, uh, to show him and earn his favor. And many of there were no photographs, obviously, in those, in those days. And he asked his court painters to paint. Uh, one of his finest bird artists was someone called Ustad Mansur. And this painting, given the almost uh, pretty close depictions of a lorikeet from Southeast Asia, of a Western tragopan, of painted sand grouse, and perhaps a duck, possibly a hybrid, a hybrid duck, because that would have been an exotic, and a dodo. Given the relative realistic portraitures of these, this is perhaps considered by experts to be perhaps the best possible representation of what a dodo may have actually looked like. Peter Mundy, who was an employee of the East India Company, records that two of them were brought to their factory at Surat between 1628 and 1634. Or he saw them there between 1628 and 1634. Jahangir died in 1627. He ruled from 1605 to 1627. And therefore, it is either one of those two dodos or perhaps a third dodo that was brought to the court. And quite possibly, because the karkhanas of the of the painters were uh, in, in Lahore, in, sorry, in, uh, in Lahore or in, uh, in Agra, quite possibly a dodo was brought to the Red Fort at Agra. Boggles the mind to this. To, can think of a dodo walking across the manicured gardens of Agra Fort. But it was there, it was painted, and the painting took was between uh, it, uh, 1624 to 1627, that is when Jan passed away. More extraordinary parrots. And look at this parrot, the broad billed parrot, a big fellow, again painted from life by this man, Joris Lael again from the log of the Dutch ship Gelderland in 1601. This was last recorded 1673. These were large parrots, huge, massive bills, and apparently fed on, fed on palm nuts, which had fallen from the, from, the tree, from the trees onto the ground. They were described as red-bodied with blue heads, which probably meant um, a rufous sort of, or a reddish chestnut body and a uh, gray, perhaps, head. A related parrot on Rodrigues, again with a huge black bill, this time green, again lived on palm nuts. And these were recorded on, in life. Uh, this had been captured by somebody. Unfortunately, it was not, a, a specimen was not preserved. This remarkable parrot was from Reunion. And in fact, uh, specimens of these lived they were taken to Europe and they lived in zoos in Paris and in, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in Prague. And uh, 
um, but in, in the wild they died. They died out largely because of hunting and predation by exotic exotics, mostly cats. The last wild birds were in the 1770s. This is uh, um, a painting that was done of a, from a bird that was in Europe. Three parrots, which are much, or four actually, which are much, look much like our Pisitacula uh, parrots. The gray parrot, which was perhaps the commonest parrot in Mauritius at that time, extinct by, seven, by 1750. Newton's parrot, parakeet blue in color, last reported in 1784. And uh, this one, uh, the Seychelles parakeet, uh, extinct again from the Seychelles. This one survives in small numbers. What is remarkable is that they are all derived from a Sitacula uh, lineage through repeated colonizations. These came in much earlier, the ancestor, and evolved into these remarkable forms. These came in later. These two are probably from large Indian parakeet ancestry. And these two are probably from uh, rose-winged rose parakeet ancestry. But uh, it, it boggles the mind to, 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 if you think about it, that all these remarkable parrots can be traced back to our Mithu Toka, which is so common across India. Scop sounds, another remarkable group. There are seven species in the, in the Indian Ocean Islands. None of them are related to, Afri to the African lineage of Scop sounds. All have perhaps. Um, uh, perhaps evolved within the, uh, the, the, the islands itself, but they are not monophyletic, which means that they are not from a single ancestor. They fall into three groups. And one group, which comprises three owls, the Seychelles scops owl, with bare legs, the Socotra scops owl, which we talked about earlier of the east coast of Africa, and the oriental scops owl, of India and Southeast Asia form one group, and the others are sister species. They are related. Now, how did this happen? Were there repeated colonizations of these islands by the Oriental Scop Saul or its ancestors? Unlikely. More likely, the most likely scenario is that the Seychelles Scop Saul went in uh, through a process of reverse colonization, colon, uh, colonization, moved into the Asian mainland and evolved into the Oriental Scop South and its various races. It's, then there, there were three owls which were called the lizard owls, larger species, bare-legged, but they are recorded and this is a sketch from a life from life uh, they, all ex they were all extinct by 1850. They formed a distinct group. Now the theory is that some ancestral Otis generated three derivative branches on the Indian Ocean Islands. One reached the Mascarines, which is uh, Mauritius, um, uh, Réunion and Rodrigues, and it evolved into uh, this, these three species there. Another radiated from Madagascar to the various islands in the Comoros and so on and so forth. And a third colonized Seychelles. And from there, about one, about six, between one, six and 1.8 or two, let's say, six to two million years ago, then reverse colonized Socotra and the Seychelles and the Indian mainland. It seems remarkable that it, because it, it's always assumed that mainland species would be better able to hold their own, having faced a lot of competition on the mainland to survive on an island rather than vice versa, which would be a much weaker species, but it does happen. Um, cuckoo shrikes, again, I'll now move very quickly. Um, uh, again, there seem to have been two uh, invasions, two colonizations from the 
One was between 11, around 11 million years ago, when the forests were continuous across, around, across Saudi Arabia, and Khorasina uh, uh, cuckoo shrikes colonized Africa as well as Madagascar. And then much later, less than 2.6 million years ago during the Pleistocene glacial period, when the, the, the islands appeared in the Indian Ocean, the Stepping Stone Islands, Reunion and Mauritius were colonized from Asia, and these are Lalagi uh, of the genus Lalagi. This is a Mauritius cuckoo shrike, and this is the female. And the female resembles some of the females of the cuckoo shrikes of this genus in Southeast Asia. Bulbuls, the black bulbuls, very like Indian Epsiphites. They seem to have come on a single colonization to perhaps to Seychelles and then radiated from there to all the uh, Indian Ocean Islands. The one in Mauritius actually looks very much like the Indian uh, black bulbul of the Himalayas. In fact, at one time they were considered to be a single species, but uh, now we know uh, perhaps no better. Um, white eyes. Um, there are two species of white eyes on Mauritius and two in reunion, each a parallel pair. One are the olive white eyes and one are the gray white eyes. They are the products of separate colonizations from India. One that came earlier evolved into, an, into the olive white eyes of these two islands with a longer beak and it acts like a sunbird um, sucking nectar from flowers with its brush tongue. Gray white eyes are generalist species have spread into both Mauritius and Reunion. They are they look, they look very unlike white eyes, but they are perhaps amongst the more common endemics of these islands and the first endemic that a visitor to the island will perhaps see. There was a third white eye invasion from Africa, more recent, about 1.2 million years ago, whose um, lineage has spread to Seychelles, Madagascar, and the Comoros. Wonderful starlings, two wonderful starlings, one is this one, one is the, the hoopoe starling or the reunion crested starling with its flaring crest, um, which uh, died out. It was common to the 1850s, but then disappeared due to destruction, hunting, and, and um, hunting by cats and rats and so on, and these uh, such like exotics. Possibly also disease because the decline was so rapid. And then this species, uh, the Rodrigues crystalline, which uh, uh, was er eradicated by rats from the main island, but lived on the offshore islands and flew to the mainland to feed, is to feed on turtle carcasses and turtle eggs. Both are extinct by the 1850s. Both who have been described in considerable detail in early accounts, in this particular one, actually reached Europe. Many caged birds were taken to Europe. And this is a stuffed specimen uh, in Amsterdam. This is a painting from life. And this is a sketch, but this is not now known only from skeletal remains. Both have ancestry in India with genetic relationship with, with sternia, our gray-headed miners uh, and uh, brahmini miners. They and these birds evolved from a common ancestor, perhaps four million years ago. I move on uh, with such um, uh, such a um, awful history of extinction. Tremendous efforts have been made in the last uh, thirty or forty years to conserve the remaining endemic species, and it started with the Mauritius kestrel. Although this is uh, not of Indian origin, this was of African origin, but it was once considered to be the rarest bird in the world, just five in, living in 1974. It was captive breeding and rewilding. The population has grown to, grew to 800 by 2005, but today there are some four, more than 400 birds in the, in the wild, and it has hopefully escaped extinction. 
similarly the pink pigeon from 20 birds in 1991 today with more than 400 in the wild today and it is being spread introduced into other um, uh, suitable forested areas of the island the echo parakeet which looks very much like our rose ring um, that was down to 8 to 12 birds in the 1980s 750 today again through captive breeding and release so it works this captive breeding and rewilding it looks very much like our, uh, like our um, rose ring parakeet when i say it on mauritius they look much darker green much shorter tailed and they don't have the pink on the back of the neck which is typical of the rose ring parakeet and where it gets, gets its name all this effort was primarily the initiative of Gerald Durrell and the Durrell, um, the Gerald Preservation Trust. It was started in 1976. It is initially concentrated on these critical and critically endangered species and has now expanded its agenda as a hands-on conservation agency. Uh, he's written several books, Gerald Durrell, and one of them is called Pink Pigeons and Golden Bats that details a fascinating story of how these three species were evolved. And finally, this is the last slide. And since we are talking about the Indian Ocean, I must make a mention of this. We've had a, a presentation on, on dragonflies on this forum. But uh, just make a mention, the globe skimmer, this dragonfly, does an annual circuit of something like 14,000 to 18,000 kilometers over 3,500 kilometers of ocean at over a thousand meters altitude, breeding along the way in Seychelles and wherever they, if it follows the intertropical convergence uh, weather zone, which brings in rain and provides fresh water for it to breed. So this circuit is completed in four generations. It follows the, this, uh, these intertropical convergence zone system winds in October, December, in autumn. And the Somali jet stream, which is the, the monsoon, southwest monsoon in June, July, from India to East Africa, stopping by some of these islands on the way. Birds migrate along the same route and using the same tailwinds and perhaps feed on these dragonflies as, along, uh, as they travel. And bee eaters we, we know of, the blue tailed and the, not but the blue cheek actually, white cuckoo, the lesser cuckoo from the Himalayas. In fact, uh, there's a population of lesser cuckoo that is resident in Madagascar, which was initially thought to be uh, derived from the Himalayan bird because of this migration and perhaps um, evolved uh, and got established there in Madagascar, but it has now been shown that it is related. Its affinity is an African, not Indian. Amur falcon, Eurasian hobby, and lesser kestrels are well-known migrants that follow this route. Let me stop here. I think I've uh, spoken more than my allotted time and um, I've spoken enough. And uh, back to you, uh, the Dipankar. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Vass. That was a fascinating talk and uh, how you ended about the little dragonfly and it's wonderful migration pattern. So um, Nikhil Kavi, uh, do you have any announcement before we take the questions uh, on chat? Yes, Tiwakar. So the chat has been opened up for questions. So in case you have any questions for Sudhir, you can start typing them there and the can ask them to Sudhir. Meanwhile, we can just go over a few announcements. Just give me one second. Right. So as most of you know, one of our partners for the Delhi Bird Talks is Sanctuary Nature Foundation. And all viewers of the Delhi Bird Talks are entitled to one year of free digital subscription to Sanctuary Asia magazine or Sanctuary Asia Cubs Kids magazine. In order to avail your free copy, you just need to go to the Delhi Bird Foundation website, which is www.delibirdfoundation.org slash offers provide your email address and details over there and you'll receive an email on the next steps on how to activate your free one-year digital subscription. 
the other announcement is that the Delibird Foundation's YouTube page is now live. So in case you would like to revisit some of the talks that have happened in the past, or in case you missed any talks and would like to view them again, they're all available here on the Delibird Foundation YouTube page. So you can just go there and subscribe to the channel to, to keep updated with the talks as and when they happen. Uh, next week, next Sunday, we have a talk on the en enigmatic world of the Finns weaver, which is perhaps one of the rarest weaver birds found in India. This is going to be by Rajat Bhargav at 5 p.m. on Sunday, 23rd August. The Zoom link is going to be the same one as today. And the last announcement is that we have the question of the day in association with Zeiss. So one viewer who gives the correct answer is entitled to win either a Zeiss binocular harness or a Zeiss cleaning kit. You can submit your answers to this website, www.telebirdfoundation.org slash contest. Sudhir, would you like to ask the question to the viewers today? Would you like me to ask this? Yes. Yes, please. Um, a number of species have been introduced from India into the Indian Ocean Islands. And if you travel, for example, to Mauritius, the first bird you are probably like, likely to see is the Indian minor. And the, uh, the first one you will hear is the red whiskered bulbul. And in the background, gray partridges in the fields. So, but in the reverse direction, the, uh, the Mascarene Islands have also been the source of a, a, a number of species and particularly botanical species across the world, uh, which have acclimatized very well um, uh, in many parts of the world. Can you mention, name a tree that was introduced into India from one of these islands in the 19th century, middle of the 19th century, as now such a familiar ornamental tree here, everywhere in India, that most Indians do not even realize it is an introduced species and not native. Thank you, Sudhir. Viewers are requested to maybe take a photograph or a screenshot of this page. We'll also be posting this question on the Delhi Bird Foundation Facebook page and Facebook group. So in case you need to refer to it later, you can submit your answers on the Delhi Bird Foundation website. Please don't give the answers away in the chat box. They would not be considered. Uh, with this, I'll hand it over to the bunker to do the question and answers. Thank you. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, Vijayaditya Singh is asking, how to plan pelagic birding trips? Well, if I were to... Uh, there are a number of pelagic birding trips being organized by birders, particularly from Bangalore and Kerala both on the East Coast and West Coast. We've had um, a couple of talks of, of pelagic birds around the Indian coastline uh, from um, Deepu K on this forum itself. And he would be the right person to ask whether, if, whether uh, as and when a, a trip is planned in the future, um, you could consider requesting a, a place. But you must realize that pelagic birding is a very, very difficult job. Uh, watching, focusing on a bird from a pitching yeah. boat yeah. Um, and uh, a pitching a bird that is so erratic in its flight and constantly fall, come, uh, falling behind a wave or above a wave, it is a very difficult job. But for those who get hooked to it, I must say it's pure poetry. Uh, we have a second question. Uh and rather a request is that uh, Ambassador Vass, there is a request that you should do a part two of your talk and perhaps uh, focus on seasonal migration context. So it would be interesting. So Nick, Kavi, maybe we can think of that. Um, I have a question which is on uh, how does one do birding in Madagascar? I mean, we hear a lot of stories is that uh, whether it is safe, whether it is birder friendly, uh, it is, How easy is, is it? Yeah, it? It will have to be a guided tour. I mean, just flying into, into Madagascar and trying to, to, uh, to find places to visit. There are not far from, from the capital, Antanana Reef, uh, is a, there are a couple of magnificent rainforest reserves. One is called Perine, which is the most easily accessible. I think it's about, if I'm not mistaken, about 40 to 50 kilometers from, from Antanana Reef and uh, good places to stay and local guides who can show you around. But if you really want to go to the southwest of Madagascar and to the north, 
um, you uh, one will have to uh, go through one of the organized tours. And there are many such, many, many such, catering, however, mostly to Europeans or South Africans. And um, uh, from what I can see, they tend to be uh, on the more expensive side. But uh, should you be able to contact some of them, or any one of them, it would be an unforgettable experience. And not just for the birds, also for the lemurs and the, yeah. uh, and the other wildlife there. Yeah, I mean, one, one knows more about the lemurs and uh, other... Mammalians and so on. Yeah, smaller mammals and reptiles, but not many people have heard about. I mean, I, that, that uh, black paradise flycatcher and stuff, they're, they're really interesting. Uh, there is one more question, which is how the million year ago is computed. Uh, is it done by carbon dating or are there other methods? Uh, no, if you are going, if you are working through, through, G, through genetic material, um, it's a tenuous uh, system, and, but pretty highly devolved, evolved uh, mathematically. I think you work through something called a molecular clock, which works on the assumption that molecular, that evolution takes place um, uh, a clockwise pattern in a certain steps, either in terms of time or in terms of generations. Uh, and having fix, fixed one fixed point, let us say if you're talking about, about Mauritius, you, if, you can, I, if you can fix the creation of, of, of uh, Mauritius, let us say 8 million years ago, use that as a fixity, and then try to see how many changes in the genetic structure have taken place and then you, from that you calculate uh, the length of time that may have possibly elapsed since the last uh, deviation took, took, took place, since the last separation took place. It, it's a, it, it works on certain assumptions, it works, uh, and it, it doesn't give you obviously a precise figure, it gives yeah. you an indicative range, of, but gives you an estimate of time and what could be the possibility. Right, so more, more of an estimate. I mean, for all, even for present animal population estimation, it's, it's not a census, it's, it's an estimate also. So, yeah, great. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I don't see any more questions in the last couple of minutes. So that's great. And in fact, what I was telling uh, Nick and Kavi is that this information is so hard to get in published form. Uh, maybe we should try from Deliberate Foundation to come up with a, with a book a compilation of all the talks uh, with the visuals and with the numbers will be really fascinating. Thank you so much, sir. Over to Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. Dipankar. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Dipankar. Thank you, Sudhir. Uh, thank you, viewers. We'll all see you next week for the talk of the Finns Weaver. Have a good evening.